Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. So Rachel, thank you so much for joining me on, on The No Show. Um, I'm really pleased to have you. Um, just as a, a brief introduction to yourself, um, could you let our audience know uh, a little bit of a background about yourself and how you came to um, research the Oigo situation? Sure. Um, I started out um, as a sinologist, I guess, um, studying Chinese culture. And then I found this um, discipline of ethnomusicology, which is really, you know, the study of um, music and sounded expression on on a, a global scale uh, and so you know I started working in in this region of um, Xinjiang which is um, um, now very much in the news of course because of the the, the terrible human rights abuses that that are occurring um, and I, I particularly became interested in questions of like religious practice and I think that was partly because you know, I'd, I'd, I spent a lot of time in my, my early career writing about um, things that people more usually call music. Um, so like my calm traditions in, in Central Asia. But, but when I started doing field work um, in, in rural areas and spending more time with women, uh, I quickly realized that um, uh, things that were called music were, were not very respectable for women to do. And so, you know, effectively I, I was being you know they were they were being cut out of of my research and so uh, i i discovered that their, their their religious practice was actually extremely musical you might say you know the 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 recited quran is, is of course you know based on uh, on the, the rules of maqam uh, they 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 sung beautiful melodic prayers about the um, the impermanence of life and the need to prepare the soul for for the grave you know and they they, they wept a lot so all of that um, became very interesting for me what drew you to these rural areas in the first place uh, I guess I've always been interested in in finding out um, you know, really a, a, of, of listening to the voices of people who don't usually get um, highlighted in, in the, <laughs> the corridors of power, right. you know, the voices of the marginalized. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, uh, and, and so no, going into a, a, rural, a rural area of, of China, um, what, especially when you're, when you're talking about being an, an ethnomusicologist and sort of realizing that music is not such a, an important factor to them. In fact, it's, it's sort of frowned upon. What sort of transition did you make? Did you just say, okay, I'll, I'll see what, the, what they're doing anyway, or did you, how did you steer towards this Islamic practice? Well, you know, I mean, in, in our discipline, I think, you know, for a long time, we've recognized that the stuff that we call music uh, is not exactly the same as what other people in the world in different parts of the world called music you know so I mean that wasn't a particular uh, concern for me you know and but it, it was just a, a recognition that that what the women were doing in their their um, hetme gatherings was you know one very musical and one very important to them and to the whole community and so really it it, it um it, it was driven by by that kind of perception you know what so always I try to work from what what's important to the people who I'm I'm working with. So, so can you give give me a, a like a a feel for what it was like in doing the field work in these sort of khatme environments? Yeah, I mean, the first time that I sat in the middle of one of those gatherings, it was it was like being hit 
by this heavy wall of emotion, you know, I've never experienced anything like it. Um, where, when you're in the middle of a, a room and it's very dark and it's very crowded and claustrophobic and hot, you know, and that was partly because it, it was, um, it was already uh, quite underground, you know, they were afraid of the someone spying on them and uh, and telling the local police that they were doing illegal religious activities, you know, so all the windows were shut, shut. And then there, there's these 60 women reciting the same rhythmic pattern over and over again and weeping and some of them going into a kind of trance. And, um, you know, when you come from this, this very kind of rational English kind of background and, uh, you know, you, you're not meant to cry in public and all of this you know it, it's very challenging to your own kind of fundamental ways of being so I, I sat in the middle of there and and of course it's very contagious that kind of emotion and so it, it's hard not to cry and I sat there thinking oh I'm an academic I shouldn't be crying and yet it was very hard mm. not to mm. and then you know finally you know, afterwards, when I, I talked with the other women, you know, they were like, oh, you know, at first we thought you were you were a spy, Rachel, because you didn't cry <laughs> like this. And it was only really when I, you know, let myself um, have that experience and that emotional response that they accepted that I was, you know, someone that was OK to talk to, really. So, so what was it that moved you to tears? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? I mean, I, I think it is just the, uh, the the contagion of the emotions, you know? I mean, I've, I'm, I'm not um, uh, a religious person, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I understand that they would be very sad to, to, to hear me say that, but I mean, you know, that is not the truth. It wasn't my own kind of like engagement with, with God that was, was, was bringing me to that feeling. It was simply just the, um, you know the vibrations in the room mm. uh, and that is a very powerful thing just straightforwardly yeah absolutely absolutely i can imagine i mean i've experienced certain things myself in, in that that sort of lend themselves to, to the experience you're talking about um but you mentioned that that they were sort of apprehensive at first or like kind of suspicious at first um how did you sort of manage to build trust for the for you to be able to do this field work well, you know, that that field work was was very unusual that I was able to go there. And, and it was fundamentally because um, I, I went through family connections. Mm. So, you know, my husband is Uyghur and we, we were spending time in a, a village where we had family relations. And so, you know, I, I think that without that kind of uh, direct connection, you know, there would have been no way that we would have got official permission to to be there. And also, it's unlikely that the women would have trusted us. You know, so I, for, for many years, I've been working as a as a team, really, with my husband. You know, I mean, we, we've we've published uh, articles together and, uh, you know, we've done a lot of field work together. So but in the women's gatherings, obviously he can't go in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't go in the mosque either, you know. So Yeah, I, I mean it sounds sounds like a really sort of a really useful setup that you, you and your husband have. Um, but in terms of sort of the the response that the authorities had towards you going to those areas, given that that those areas are widely sort of considered to be suspicious or you know, have to be monitored. How was the authorities' response to you going there? Yeah, you know, I mean, it had always been, always ever since I started trying to do research in this region, you know, a long time before I met my husband even, it had always been very difficult to, to get out of the cities. And I think, you know, there is this fundamental uh, thing uh, amongst Chinese officials, which goes all the way up to top government down to like local village officials. And it's this question of like, you don't want to lose face. Mm -hmm. And the primary way to lose face is by showing foreigners, poor people, you know? Okay. It took me a long time to understand that, but oh, really wow. you know, there was this extreme aversion to, to letting, letting us see any 
form of poverty, you know, because they assumed, you know, that was how they would be judged. Mm. That's that, that's really fascinating. And so then the, the aspect of the, the short, sort of suspicion or, or, or their attitudes towards the oil wasn't in play. It was more of just them trying to save face. I think that was the fundamental thing, you know, and, you know, I, I, I think it is all wrapped up together. You know, I mean, the, the, so there is a, a judgment of Uyghur society as being poor, which mm. demonstrably in, in a lot of areas it still is, you know, uh, but also of it being backward, you know, that they have this very strong narrative of like, um, you know, social and educational development. And so poor rural people are backward. They don't, you know, they're uncivilized, mm. you, know, you know, and so they didn't want foreigners in, engaging with that either they didn't want that kind of thing to be seen and so you know also of course you know they didn't they didn't want their their country citizens to be like that backward and you know lacking in civilized qualities and they they judged like islam fundamentally as as an important part of why those people were backward mm -hmm. you know so that so so you know my 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 interest in in their their religious faith and practice was obviously a big problem and and of course that is also all, all wrapped up with the, the whole kind of campaign uh in xinjiang you know i mean obviously you can't argue that a million Uyghurs are all religious extremists and terrorists i yeah. mean you know i mean it's ridiculous isn't it um and, and we have to keep saying that, you know, I mean, that is still the argument, right, that they locked up a million people because they said they were all, you know, in, in danger of um, becoming terrorists because they were infected with religious extremism. Mm. You know, I mean, it's, it's madness, isn't it? But I mean, the problem was the, the definition of religious extremism, which was fundamentally religion. You know, they, they, they were, they believed in, in Islam and so, automatically you know they were um in danger of of um becoming terrorists <laughs> you know i mean that's it, it it is a ridiculous thing isn't it but i mean that is obviously an attitude which is not only confined to china mm -hmm. no absolutely it's, it's reflective of a, of a major sort of um attribution of religiosity towards either terrorism or counter-terrorism and there's this narrative that you're either your either your religion is either part of the problem or part of the solution. There, there's no like alternative viewpoint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I mean, undoubtedly, it's been taken to to a, an extreme uh, in the Xinjiang re region. You know, so I mean, your beard would get get you in into an internment camp like a shot. You know, I mean, that would be one of the seventy five signs of religious extremism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Uh, People, people sometimes ask, you know, so, okay, if you, if you think that Chinese authorities are Islamophobic, then why is it that the Chinese speaking Muslims have been relatively okay? Mm -hmm. You know, why is it only the Uyghurs and not the, the Hui Muslim Chinese, you know? And, and I think that is also to do, to do with this problem of like, what they regard as civilized. You know, so you can get away with being Muslim in China as long as you kind of you speak the Chinese language and as long as your mosque has like those nice kind of sloping Chinese roofs instead of a Middle Eastern like minaret and dome, you know, mm. so. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you raise so many interesting points, especially about the sort of campaigns, but I want to get into that in a minute. First, I want to ask you about your experience being in and amongst the Uyghurs. Well, how do they live? Why is it that they're seen as backwards by the Chinese? Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, it is interesting to think about my own kind of personal journey because I, I, I started out like I studied Chinese first and then I, I'm, I started visiting this, this region of Xinjiang or East Turkestan, as the Uyghurs call it, you know. Mm. And I think when I first arrived there, you know, as, as someone who was speaking Chinese and not speaking Uyghur, 
and who was mainly spending time with Chinese people. You know, I, I really absorbed the attitudes of um, Chinese people there, which were, were quite intolerant and fearful mm -hmm. of Uyghurs. You know, so, I mean, you know, there are clearly problems of, of inter-ethnic tensions and racism in, in the region. And that, those go back, you know, decades more, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah, so you know, it 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 took took quite a long time to change, and and really the the way that it did was was obviously by by spending more time with Uyghur people, you know, it's it's such an obvious thing, isn't it? But then you know you be, you 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 make those personal connections and you you eat together and you 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 play music together. For me, you know, that was a a way in, and then you you understand the humanity of people. But very sadly, of course, increasingly in that region, the the, the Chinese inhabitants and the, the, the Muslim populations, they weren't mixing. And so they weren't having those those opportunities to, to come together and recognize each other's humanity. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really it's, it's really a, a, a sort of a complex issue because I mean, to me anyway, because uh, uh, you really have to take with a pinch of salt the fact that there's extreme coverage of like the situation in, in these sort of camps um, from people like Fox News and CNN who, you know, obviously don't have the Muslim interest at heart. And it's, it's more of a, a, a sort of a political play to sort of, you know, go hand in hand with the trade war that they have with, with China. But that doesn't obviously take away from the fact that the the camps do exist and there is terrible things happening. So, from the sort of I, I'm guessing through the through the connections through family etc. What 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 is the situation in those camps? So uh, you know, I mean, there are terrible things coming out from the camps. It, it's it's been quite difficult to get reliable information because they are so secretive, but there are now people who have been released and allowed to get out to Kazakhstan, for example, uh, or people who were in, in them in the early stage who, who've managed to get out to, to Turkey. Um, and we have some, some very powerful testimonies from, from those people. So, you know, aside from the, the, the basic, um, regime that goes on about the re-education and the self-criticism that people are meant to undergo and, and this kind of uh, learning of the, the thought of Xi Jinping, you know, the, the Chinese president and singing revolutionary songs, all of this. But I mean, it's, it is the, the accounts of the, the brutality and the abuse that's going on, which, which is really very disturbing. So, you know, there are, there are accounts of, of rape, which are really now very well documented, um, uh, deprivation of food, um, deliberate torture. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, there's a lot of very disturbing stuff that's mm -hmm. coming out. What, one of the sort of challenges in this situation is trying to unpack the truth from, from obviously the, the general problem that is happening in China. And obviously, like you said at the beginning, you can't, it's not feasible that a million people are all terrorists. It's not feasible that a million people are all extremists. But then you have, on the, on the other hand, you have, you know, reports that come out from the Syrian government and the Iraqi government that say up to 5,000 Oigo jihadists are in Syria, up to 10,000 Oigo jihadists have been killed in Iraq. These are extremely large numbers. So how does that sort of lend itself to the Chinese attitudes towards Uyghurs? Yeah, I, I mean, I, of course, I don't deny the, the, the truth, the validity of those, those reports. Uh, it, I, I know very well that there are large numbers of, of Uyghurs who ended up in Syria and ended up in, in Iraq, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, we, we, we need to really trace 
um, back what what happened to those individuals in in mm. detail to understand um, really what was going on, you know. So the Islamic revival, if you want to call it that, you know, these kind of um, these these um, the, these social developments, these religious developments of of like new kinds of Islam, reformist Islam coming into Uyghur communities. That, that was going on since um, the 1980s, even 80s and 90s, you know, these um, preachers were, were uh, traveling around local villages, they were preaching new forms of Islam, you know, and so like the, the, the forms of religious belief and practice that people followed, it did begin to change that. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, which of course is not necessarily to say that the new forms of Islam that were coming in were extremism or terrorism. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just saying, you know, there were reformist forms of Islam coming in, but that began to make the local authorities nervous. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they didn't recognize it. They didn't like it. Um, you know, fundamentally, I think that kind of shift in religious sensibilities was a threat to the authorities and so they started to crack down you know mm. and so already in the mid 90s you have these kind of um you know big crackdown on religious expression and you know always a lot of repression of, of freedom of speech and the right to demonstrate and all this so you know people were not existing on a level playing field uh, and people began to, to, to find ways to run away, you know? So there were a lot of people who uh, left, they went to Malaysia, they tried to get out to Turkey, you know, because they were experiencing constant daily harassment from, from the local police, you know? Mm. So in these, these situations, you know, it, it's, um, it's not hard for, for that kind of anti-state um, sentiment to breed, you know, if, yeah. if you've been locked up a few times uh, for for very minor infringements of, of um, rules you don't understand you know um you know i mean uh, re really you should be talking to my colleague sean roberts about these kind of questions because he um has been writing for quite some time now about um what he calls a self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. in china whereby you know, China back in 2001 labeled the Uyghurs pretty much as an ethnic group, as extremists and terrorists. And the policies that were um, enacted on the basis of that assumption really in, in the end brought about the reality um, that they'd kind of anticipated. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so he spent a lot of time in, in Istanbul doing interviews with Uyghur migrants there. Um, some of whom, whom I think had been um, fighting in Syria. And, and he traced these kind of international networks of um, people who'd um, been, been smuggled to Malaysia or Indonesia and then to, to Turkey. And, and sometimes they were, they were fighting in Syria because they, they'd incurred so much debt, for example. Uh, they, they paid such large amounts of money to the, the people smugglers that, you know, they were, they needed to to join up in order to pay off their debts you know mm -hmm. things like this so you know when when you start looking at the specific stories of individuals who have have um, followed these kind of journeys then you know you're much better able to make judgments about who is a terrorist and who is not mm -hmm. i mean the the most common sort of thread that i've encountered whether it's looking at terrorism and uh, terrorism attacks in the uk or throughout Europe or you know ISIS etc is that it stems from um, both a naivety from the individuals and a, an in, enormous enormous level of inequality that they they faced um, which are ultimately leads people in this direction now in the case of the Uyghurs moving forward is there a possibility that there could be some kind of like reforms put in place that is are fair to both parties, to, to the Uyghur community, to sort of say, to ensure that, okay, we're going to have these measures, but that we don't have extreme number of 
people going to fight in different places? Or is it just a thing that is just going to, is it just like a, a too complex a problem to be solved? I, I don't believe that it is too complex a problem to be solved. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, there, there, there would surely be ways to create a more equitable environment for Uyghurs as a people and as a culture to flourish. But unfortunately, I think we are a very long way away from that at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and really, you know, the, the wholesale nature of, of this campaign, which is now underway uh, under Xi Jinping, uh, under which we've seen, you know, hundreds of Uyghur intellectuals, people who are entirely secular, you know, and uh, Uyghur musicians, Uyghur comedians, you know, this whole kind of layer of, of Uyghur um, cultural and political leaders has effectively been silenced, wiped out, you know, they've been um, sacked from their jobs, they're, they're sitting in internment camps. Many of my colleagues and friends who I work with for, for years are, are still sitting in internment camps with no, no news of their whereabouts. You know, I mean, why, why were they detained, you know? Um, are they likely, um, is, is it likely that they have been infected by the virus of Islam and are prone to, to violent attacks? You know, of course not, it's, it's rubbish. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what, what I think is really going on there is a, is a very deliberate attempt at cultural erasure you know, yeah, I mean, it seems very clear to me that the, the the decision has been made right at the top of Chinese government. And you can see this from leaked documents that um, Xi Jinping himself has been directly involved in this decision, which is to, um, you know, to stop all recognition of Uyghur identity and culture, except where it's a kind of, you know, a... Um, a surface recognition, you know, a tourist attraction fundamentally, just to, to, to dissipate the use of the language, to dissipate that cultural identity. And so you see, you know, the, um, the, the internment of the, the cultural elite, you see massive um, disruption of communities with these big rehousing projects. Mm -hmm. uh, you see the destruction of all kind of um, religious, architecture, um, the, the, um, the removal of cemeteries, of graveyards, you know, so all of this seems clearly designed to separate Uyghurs from their cultural and religious roots and to, uh, to, to drive forward um, a very hard policy of assimilation. I want to ask you a, a bit about the, uh, about your, your new book, Soundscapes of Uyghur Islam. Um, Firstly, who is the book for? That's an academic book. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it was written for, for an academic audience. Um, obviously, people in my home discipline uh, of ethnomusicology uh, and also for, for people who are interested in the, the academic study of that, that region. So Central Asianists, Sinologists. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, as, as well as the the book itself, I try to to reach out to wider audiences. Mm -hmm. So I, I've I've done a fair amount of um, blogging and public speaking and talking to um, various media outlets since since the crisis really blew up in two thousand and seventeen. Just to get to try to get my uh, my ideas out there. It, it's been a an interesting journey for me, you know, because uh, uh, I, I had very little media exposure or, or experience of how, how to really get the message out before before of this and uh, this is obviously the, the book is is what's, what's really interesting about the book is 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 based on 10 years of of real like in-depth research into you know these communities these practices um what do you hope um somebody who, who picks up the book what do you hope what they get from it in terms of like in in terms of content in terms of understanding of the region you know i mean i, I hope primarily that they engage with the humanity 
mm -hmm. of the women that I was working with. You know, I, I, I give quite a lot of space in the book to their, their words. You know, I directly quote them, I, I translate them. Uh, you know, it was one of those sort of sad decisions that you have to make. Can I include their, their images in the book? Can I include their photos? And of course we decided that would not be a good idea in the yeah, current yeah. circumstances, you know. So, I mean, that's the important thing primarily. But also, you know, just just to also press the importance of my approach to understanding, you know, so the value of that kind of personal engagement, the value of um, actually being in the region and spending time talking to people, uh, you know, I mean, there are so many experts in counterterrorism there who, who have um, a very important voice in, in various arena. You know, and I, I personally think that uh, their their forms of knowledge gathering are deeply inadequate and misinformed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and, um, so, where, where can people find you online? Where can people sort of find the, the blog pieces that that you've worked on? Um, and just in general, just where can people interact with you online? All right. Well, you you can find my my contacts through my my personal profile on the SOAS website, SOAS University of London. Uh, we have a website linked to the book, which is called um, Sounding Islam in China. Mm -hmm. So we've got quite a lot of good uh, material up there. And I'm on Twitter. Um, what's your Twitter handle by any chance? It's uh, Rachel A. Harris. Excellent. I'll link everything onto the episode anyway, so people can have direct access to it. Um, just finally, what advice would you give to anyone looking to sort of understand the Oigo communities and the Oigo, and the Oigo Islam and, and the Oigo situation in, in a bit more detail? What, what advice would you, would you give them? Well, you know, I mean, if you're dealing in, in English language, then uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have some great colleagues out there who have also produced excellent books. Uh, I've already mentioned Sean Roberts' name, also perhaps Darren Byer, Ryan Thumb. Uh, there, there, there's a great community of scholars out there. Um, you know, and if, if you want to, to engage with um, Uyghur voices, then there are a lot of people active, uh, again, on Twitter, some great, you know, young people. Uh, if you want to know more about the situation in the camps, um, there's a really extraordinary organization called um, the Xinjiang Victims Database, mm. which has um, a lot of testimonies gathered from people who have been detained or who have um, relatives who are in the camps. There are a lot of very brave, I think, very brave um, young Uyghurs out there on social media now who've been engaging in these kind of campaigns like me too, Uyghur is a good one. Uh, and they've been uh, filming their own um, personal testimonies again about their, their own relatives and putting those online. So, so there's a lot out there. There's a great um, Uyghur youth network called the Tarim Network, which promotes various causes and introduces like um, young, young Uyghurs in the diaspora who are doing interesting things. So there are many ways to get, get engaged. No, that's a, that's really excellent advice, and it sounds like there's there's a really sort of healthy amount of um, resources out there. Um, Rachel, thank you so much for joining me. I'm I'm really pleased to have had the chance to speak to you, and um, I hope to have you on sometime soon. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video, and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.